Thanks for watching How to Build a Motorcycle Part 1 by CustomChoppersGuide.com. In this series, we're going to discuss how a motorcycle chopper is built, and you'll have confidence by the end of this four video series to build your own bike. We won't cover every nitty gritty detail in every part and how to put it together, but uh, you will have confidence moving into your next build, and you'll at least be able to speak intelligently about how choppers and motorcycles are built. I am not a professional speaker, as I mentioned in the first video series, How to Build a Motorcycle Frame, and I will stumble over some words and sentences because I'm reading from information we have here at customchoppersguide.com, but I think you'll find the information both helpful and very informative. At least that's our goal here. So let's begin. One way or another, we now have an unpainted steel or chrome molly frame. From here, we need to add wheels, some kind of motive force, gearing, brakes, electrics, lights, forks, gas tank, handlebars, fenders, and a seat. We will need to build up the bike, then take it to pieces again, carefully paint the frame and metalwork, and then reassemble it so it works. This is what we are going to do. First of all, I will look at the components and then run through an assembly. The forks. This is something to think about early on. For me, there are forks on the market that are beautiful and there are forks that just do the job. It's a matter of taste, like everything else to do with motorcycles and choppers. Each of the main types of forks available on the market should theoretically have triple trees to fit your frame. You need to consider various things before purchasing anything and your best bet is to discuss your frame and intended setup, in particular the wheel sizes, with the company you're buying your forks from. It's often necessary to buy forks that are specially suited for the rakes, the larger rakes of 33 degrees or more. Most forks are designed for a more upright rake and just won't work properly when laid back because the stresses are so different. You don't want to see forks flexing in the wrong direction. It means they aren't working. There are three main types of forks used in motorcycles and choppers. Girders, springers, and hydraulic forks. Girders, so named for the classic girder cross pieces that the springs attach to, are fairly rare. They have four girders in a box shape set around the neck tube. Girders were the fork of choice on the British bikes of the pre-war years from which many original choppers were derived, and some riders still find this choice of fork gives a more authentic look. Some manufacturers argue that the girders handle bigger rigs over 30 to 38 degrees better than any of the hydraulic forks. Here we have an image of a uh, set of girder forks. We have the plans for these, this unique design at customchoppersguide.com. Springer forks, these are the forks with one or two large coil springs on display at the neck end. At the wheel end is a little shock arrangement based around a visible hinge attached to the bike. It's attached via the neck struts and the springs. Like girders, some riders and builders consider these forks more fitting to the chopper look. Here is uh, an image of a set of Springer forks, and again, we have the plans for these at customchoppersguide.com. Hydraulic forks. These are the most common type and are seen on almost all modern factory motorcycles. Hydraulic forks contain a shock and spring in a single closed unit. You can't see the spring. Particular care must be taken to get a hydraulic shock made for the job as mentioned here. For example, hydraulic shocks are available as inverted shocks where the lower part slides into the top part rather than the other way around, as in the standard non-inverted case. This is designed to help manage the unusual strain the shocks take when placed at extreme angles. Imagine how a shock poorly designed for the job might spend much of its time scraping up against the inside walls leading, leading to a lead and drive rider, excuse me, lead and ride. Many hyd hydraulic forks are designed for the job, however, and do it very well. So getting the right forks, you'll need different length forks to match the, set, the setup of your motorcycle. The best way of getting suitable forks is to know what job you need them to do. To do this, measure the space the forks will need to fit in. You will need to know what wheels and tires you're going to use. Ideally, fit the rear tire and block the frame up to ride height. You'll then have something that looks like the, this figure here. The measurements you'll need to discuss when buying or ordering forks are the rake angle, the two neck tube heights as shown here, the radius of the wheel and tire, and the radius of the inside of the neck stem. Then specify and weight. 
Hardware. This section on the nuts and bolts could fit anywhere, so I've put it in here in this video. This is a picture of a cap screw. It has a bearing surface for biting into a washer. If it didn't, it would be it would be a bolt. These little parts are important. Use cap screws of a good quality and nuts with a fine thread that are self-locking. When we say good quality, we're referring to grade 5 and 8 bolts. These should have a manufacturer's mark, a symbol or initials, and have three lines, grade 5 or six lines, grade 8, radiating outward on the head. Those without the marks are likely to be hardware bolts and not up to the job. The reason some bolts are better than others are that they can stand up to more abuse. This is measured by their snapping point, ultimate tensile strength, UTS, and the point at which they begin deforming and acting in a plastic rather than elastic way. This is the yield point. This table shows how this varies. Don't use a grade 2 on a chopper or a motorcycle. Obviously, if you buy chrome-plated bolts, you won't see the marks, so use a good trustworthy supplier who can tell you what grade they are. Allen brand bolts that use a socket-headed cap are usually considered to be between grade 5 and 8, and sometimes better than a grade 8. But this depends very much on the manufacturer, so again, use some, some, someone good. A stainless steel bolt, unless bought from a specialist supplier who says otherwise, is likely to be less good than a grade 2 bolt, and certainly not suitable for a, a bike. The nut is also important. Use self-locking nuts, and obviously the finer the thread combination of nut and bolt, the more metal in contact, and the safer the bolt, up to a point. Any good quality combination will be safe enough. Self-locking nuts do not shake loose from the vibration of the ride and do not need to be tightened really hard, so don't run the risk of damaging the material sandwiched between the bolt and nut. Self-locking nuts come in all shapes and sizes, and the plastic collared type, nylon collared, are fine for most jobs. Because they are made from nylon, they aren't very good for any bits that get very hot, like around the exhaust, so here you can use an all-steel lock nut. Plumbing. While we're on the subject of the extra bits and pieces, we should discuss the pipes that carry liquid, oil lines, brake lines, and fuel lines. Brake lines that connect the master cylinder to the calipers handle large pressures of nearly 1,000 pounds per square inch. For this reason, it's necessary to buy something that is built for the job. The piping will have a metal braided cover around some, of, some other material. This inner material affects the braking feel. Teflon doesn't expand, so you don't feel any sponginess in the braking. Other specifically designed types that don't feature Teflon work fine, however. Hoses come in three sizes, from the smallest to the largest, dash 2, dash 3, and dash 4. The number refers approximately to the number of sixteenths of an inch that make up their diameter. Dash 3, roughly three sixteenths of an inch, is the most commonly used size. Given the vibrations that motorcycles cause, any loose exposed metal, like the hoses, will, if left unchecked, rub away paintwork and finally damage the surrounding metal. This can be avoided by using steel clamps to keep the lines from rubbing, and also by casing the metal in a plastic sheath. Plastic also insulates electrically, pr protecting against electrical shorts. So that's it for part one. In part two, we're going to cover brakes, wheels, tires, powertrain, and the engine. Thanks for watching part one by Custom Chopper's Guide, How to Build a Motorcycle, and we'll see you in part two.